Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Mammoth Sight video that we're going to be posting on our Facebook and probably on our YouTube. Uh, so, for today, we're, the reason we're doing this video is because May 22nd is World International Biodiversity Day. And to you know, kind of describe that and explain why paleontology is important for biodiversity, I brought along Tim, one of our interns and one of our seasonal guys, who has also got a bachelor's degree in evolutionary biology. So first of all, Tim, what is evolutionary biology? So evolutionary biology, um, as opposed to say like microbiology, um, focuses a lot more between the relationships uh, animals share and how they fit into their environments. So how does the environment impact animals? How do animals impact the environment? And that segues in great into my next question. What is biodiversity? When, when it comes down to it, what's the, what's the simple in, uh, definition of biodiversity? So usually when we talk about biodiversity, we're referring to number of species that an area can support. Um, certain environments, such as grasslands, have a fairly low biodiversity, but places like, say, jungles tend to have a lot of species crammed into a very small area. So usually biodiversity refers to the number of species. And what can that, what, how does that help biologists and ecologists? Like, what can biodiversity be like an indicator for? So in many ways, biodiversity is good at measuring the health of an ecosystem, because the more varied animals you have indicates more environmental niches for them to fill. So in, say, a jungle, you know, it's fairly healthy in the sense that you might have a dozen types of monkeys that all compete for very niche um, resources, but there are space for them in a biological sense. And so does biodiversity at all kind of go into like the interaction between species as well? Oh, for sure. So in fact, the competition between species often leads to enhanced biodiversity. Um, pressures that one species puts on another species will actually force animals to you know, go extinct or find a different role in the environment to play. Speaking of roles and environments and different, like, differences in species and stuff, we've got a bunch of skulls and replicas of skulls in front of us. Why do we have the ones we do? So the skulls we picked out today are super interesting in that they represent the five most diverse orders of mammals that are around today. Um, so if you'd like to go through them, we, we can go yeah. through the ones that we have. Yeah, so some, of these I'm, so, so some of these our viewers are probably familiar with. Some of them might be a little bit more confusing, but they've definitely seen representatives of them in the past. So let's, let's start with these three right here. These ones, the ones I'm, we, and we were just at Snake River, so we can kind of talk about. So these are bison skulls, right? Mm -hmm. what, so what, what group are bison a part of that's considered to be extreme, have a high biodiversity? So artiodactyls are the even-toed ungulates, and bison are a good example of an even-toed ungulate. But it also includes things like, say, cows, goats, deer. Um, it's a very diverse group, so I think it's number three most diverse order of mammals. And right here we've got a couple of different skulls of different varieties. So we've got this one here. This is modern bison or bison bison. We've got bison antiquus, which is an ancient extinct form of bison. And then we've got my personal favorite, which is bison priscus, or the steppe bison, which is one, the one that's really neat because we think this is the one that crossed over the land bridge. And we'll be talking about this in a little bit uh, as well, but the un understanding of biodiversity does play in, into paleontology a pretty you know, great degree, right? For sure. I mean, all the same things you as a biologist would be looking for in living ecosystems, you can reconstruct in extinct ecosystems by looking at the fossils. Um, so some animals you know, live in a variety of habitats, like say primates, um, and others don't. So just having a single fossil of a certain type of animal can tell you a lot about the ecology of an area, right? So we've got, so we've got the bison here. We've also got these ones, which these are enlarged about 700 times, but these are bat skulls. Mm -hmm. So what makes bats like a bio, like what, what, what makes them like an interesting group to talk about when it comes to biodiversity? So bats are super interesting in that they are the second most diverse order of living mammals. Um, even in like um, your neighborhood, you probably have a dozen species of bats that live in your neighborhood. Um, and they have a very wide diet and a very wide um, geographic range too. So bats are super interesting because they are extremely diverse. Um, for example, I believe we have here a fruit eating bat and this one is actually a vampire bat. So bats can be eating things like um, bugs or blood or fruits or gums from trees. They're a very diverse group of animal. So this one is, the, at least as far as I'm aware, is the greater false vampire bat. Whereas this one's the vampire bat. So this one eats insects as well and, and small rodents and such. Whereas this guy is entirely pretty much a liquid diet. Yeah, if you're curious, they actually have lost and greatly reduced all the molar teeth. They have really no ability to chew. They just have these piercing front teeth. Um, as compared to, say, this one, where you can see these back molars are functional teeth. They can actually be used to process food. All right, so we talked about artiodactyls. We talked about... 
bats, which I believe the group Chiro Chiropterans? Chiropterans, yes. And so I know this one is one of your favorites to talk about. So I'm going to let you kind of like take the reins on this one. This one's a baboon skull, right? Yep, this is a baboon. Um, primates are super interesting because they're one of the largest bodied, very diverse group of mammals. So in the case of monkeys, there are hundreds of species of monkeys. Um, and they go as far north as the Japanese macaque, which lives like in Arctic conditions. Um, and they have almost a global distribution. So they're very interesting animals. Um, not only monkeys, right, but you also have things like lemurs and apes. So they inhabit a lot of environmental roles um, as well. But unlike, say, bats, they're really large animals. And unlike, say, artiodactyls, they don't just, they're not just grazers. They have a variety of things that they do in their environments. So you can look at primates and they're a pretty good indicator of biodiversity. And so like when we talk about primates, it's also, we also have to factor in that humans are, uh, ourselves were primates, right? Mm -hmm. And so basically, so you get like, I'm, I'm thinking of like, is it the pygmy uh, marmoset that's like the one that can like fit on your pinky finger versus you get yeah, something like, like the size this big. <laughs> versus like something the size of like a silverback gorilla. Mm -hmm. Well, and humans are interesting because they have a global distribution, right? Um, but remember that all humans are of the same species, so they're not really contributing to biodiversity themselves, even if the numbers are really high. Awesome. So, so we've got artiodactyls, we've got chiropterans, we've got primates. This guy, he's got a very familiar set of teeth, okay. but he's a little bit larger than most of the things our, our viewers are probably familiar with. So this is the skull of a capybara, so it's the largest living rodent. Um, super cool. As Seth mentioned, these ever-growing front incisors are one of the defining traits of rodents. So if you ever see those teeth, that is definitely a rodent. Um, but, you know, capybaras are pretty cool as far as rodents are concerned because they're one of the most drastically adapted rodents. So, um, in many ways, they have, inhabit the same niche as, say, like a hippo does. So they're a semi-aquatic, very large animal that lives on, like, riverbanks. And they even eat kind of the same things as hippos do. So they're interesting because in South America, you didn't have the same mammal groups present as in Africa. So one of those opportunistic rodents decided they were going to inhabit that niche that, say, hippos fill. So kind of fun to see these things because they're very different than the mice or the rats you're probably accustomed to when you think rodents. So when we talk about niches, we kind of, we, we brought them up a couple of times and you mentioned um, like that these guys are going to be in a slightly different size mm. like area. What makes, how does that something switch niches? Like how does, so like how does something go from being like, for example, most people think of rodents, they think of small, like they like think that eat like a lot of vegetation. How does something get into the, you know, like the hippo like realm as far as their, like their, their lifestyle? Well, so when there are open um, food resources, for example, in an environment, animals will trend towards being able to fill those niches because if you're capable of doing so, you have no competition. So it tends to be that you get radiations of animals when you have open environmental space. So let me use an example. When the meteor killed off most of the dinosaurs, there was a lot of open ecological space for mammals to diversify and fill. So soon after the dinosaurs mostly go extinct, you see a wide radiation of many mammal groups because they're filling the spaces that prior had been filled by dinosaurs. So it's almost like another way to kind of think of it is like if like let's say you've got you know a bunch of siblings and you're like you know you're you're, you're sharing rooms or you're sharing a bathroom or something and then when one of your siblings goes off to college mm -hmm. then you can kind of claim that their their room or their niche space and so that way you don't even have more space you have more resources available to you basically. That's a really good example, yeah. The best way to think about it is that the niches are kind of eternal, right? The environment is slowly changing, but generally speaking, the niche is always out there. So you'll often get animals from different uh, orders converging on that same niche. So use the hippo and the capybara example, right? A hippo is an artiodactyl, like say a bison is, but a capybara is a rodent. And these two different orders both had animals kind of come to similar body plans because they wanted to inhabit the same niche. And so lastly, so we've got artiodactyls, got chiropterans, we've got, we've got uh, primates, we've got rodents, and then that's our giant short-faced bear skull. What group does that represent for us? So uh, short-faced bears, um, just like things like dogs and cats, are of the order of carnivora. Um, so you'll probably recognize them as most of the carnivorous mammalian predators. Um, but it also includes things like badgers, um, so there are smaller members of this order. Um, and what's kind of fun about these guys is because they're predators and they eat other things, they're also a really good marker for biodiversity because you don't get um, really uh, hyper-specified predators in low biodiversity areas. So, you know, it tends to be that you have a nice diversity of large carnivores in an area that also supports a large diversity of herbivores. And it's, 
when, when we talk about like, like you know these different like ecosystems, these different areas and stuff, we mentioned a little bit at the beginning about like how paleontology can kind of factor into that. Paleontology is kind of nice because it can let us kind of see not only what like we can compare today's biodiversity to uh, past biodiversities, correct? Mm -hmm. So like the, like you know we can see how many species and get an idea of how the environment's changing and what and where we can we can kind of see like where drop offs happen, correct? For sure, yeah. And so in addition to the shrew, we've also got the mole, which will hold up. A little bit. I just want to be careful with it because these are, like I said, these are very fragile. But you can kind of see this guy fits pretty comfortably in the palm of my hand. Slash, again, pretty much on the tip of my thumb. I don't want to move him out there just in case he accidentally decides to blow over. But so you can see, some we have really large animals, important in biodiversity, and really small animals. And it's important to note too that some like the di like the diversity of these animals is going to just impact diversity itself. Correct. Yeah, for sure. So when you look at these really common orders of mammals, you'll notice that a lot of them have very specific ecological reasons for why they're diverse. So for example, chiropterans, which are bats, are primarily insectivorous, at least in the United States, um, similar to, say, like shrews. Um, so, you know, the diversity of insects is, you know, supporting the diversity of, say, bats. Um, Similar things with, say, rodents and primates. Rodents and primates have very broad diets. They can eat almost anything. And as a result, they have a lot of potential niche space that they can then go and fill. So most of these animals are diverse for reasons that, as a biologist, you can kind of deduce. So it's kind of almost like a domino effect where, like, you know, if there's a bunch of, so like, for example, like, flowers and like, like, you know, like angiosperms, the flowering plants, they get really diverse so that insects that utilize those for food get really diverse and then you can see the animals that are eating the insects get diverse and then basically just kind of, it kind of just goes and goes on and goes on and goes on until we have the, diver the biodiversity of our ecosystem today. Well, and that's why it's really important to always be aware of your environmental impacts, even if it's on something unrelated to things that you care about because, you know, impacting, say, the plant life of an area will definitely have a trickle-down effect on everything that lives there. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's like, you often hear about, like, you know, like the food chain, but in reality, it's more of like a food web in that, like, you know, there's every, there's everything's kind of interconnected, and if you remove one block of it, you know, stuff can kind of get jumbled up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, is there anything else you want, like, any final thoughts you want to leave as far as biodiversity? Um, so maintaining biodiversity has a lot of benefits to humans that maybe people don't really think about. I mean, why should you care about, say, the diversity of rodents? Well, to be to truth be told, a lot of the interesting, say, medical advances or food options for humans come from this nice diversity of animals. So a lot of promising medical research comes out of obscure plants that are found in jungles, just to give you one example. So biodiversity is really enriching to human existence equally to all other animals, right? Not only that, like there's, there's the, you know, that there's through those reasons, but then also the fact that it's just kind of, it's incredible to be able to study all of these different animals and be a part of, you know, we often think of humans as being separate from the ecosystem, but in reality, we're an extremely important part. And we have, you know, there, there's a lot of like, you know, we have, we have impacts in certain ways. And so it's really cool to be able to see, you know, be, you know, realize just how vast the world that we're a part of is. Yeah.